Yeah, so my name is Matthias, and um, I just uh, finished my education from, uh, from Roskilde University, where I uh, became uh, what we call uh, an environmental planner. And my thesis, I was working with this concept of a circular economy, and I was basically looking into the area of uh, electronics, electronic waste, uh, and ICT products in, in general, because uh, uh, ICT is like information communication technologies. So, so it's, that's mobile phones and tablets and computers and all the nice things that you use every day. And uh, why I looked into those products was because it was, um, you know, they are so valuable to us as, you know, a modern society. This, of course, conflicts with the issue of sustainability because they not unlike many other products, so quickly become waste, but also have a, a high embedded value in terms of mineral resources. So that's why they make them a little more interesting. And um, in this first part of the session, I want to briefly scope the background problems of this massive resource use that is feeding production. Um, then secondly, I will, I will go into the more theoretical background of a circular economy and circular systems. And um, finally, I will finish the session with some examples of possible solutions, or at least the solutions I have been working on and looking into. So basically, the first graph here shows us this enormous use of material that we take from Earth's crust, or um, like also including like biomass, for instance. So all the plants, whatever we take from Earth's crust every year to produce our goods and services. And uh, that's an awful lot. Um, this is an input-output analysis made by a scientist team a couple of years ago. And uh, it's pretty famous, so a lot of people have probably seen it before. <coughs> the, the most important thing is to see this uh, exponential curve uh, just going up in the last century. And this next one is only the metal and uh, mineral resource extraction. And this is, of course, interesting because a lot of metal and metals in, uh, are going into electronics. So this is the thing. And after using all these nice electronic things, uh, we kind of end up with this picture. You're probably familiar with some of them. And it's clearly a waste of resources and toxics go into waterways and yeah. It's just a mess. It's a dump site um, somewhere in, in, in a, in a um, developing country. Um, and here we have like a guy in, in Africa burning some, some uh, copper wires, I think it is, um, yeah, to get the copper out. Um, and the same goes here where a Chinese woman is, is sitting and, and cooking uh, uh, PCBs or printed circuit boards to, to get some of the metals out. Uh, it's very inefficient the way and it's of course a very, very toxic and has all sorts of problems uh, connected to it. This slide basically shows the life cycle from the mine and to the product. And uh, if we start with like taking some minerals, we, we, we do uh, some combination and, and crushing, grinding these metal, uh, minerals. And uh, so they've been prepared to, um, to, to come into the smelter uh, and then getting refined. We are getting down here to some metal product fabrication and then uh, we can get them onto the, the supply chain where like, some component manufacturer makes some sort of part and then it goes on to assembly and manufacture. So it's a long, long process and there's a lot of steps in between and basically nobody actually knows where the start is. Like this is, you, you, you do studies today where you track the metals where they actually come from in the world, but none of the producers that, that enters down here actually really know where this, the stuff they use actually come from. And if you look at like all the 
problems we have in this phase before the product is actually, you know, made. Uh, there's tons of issues we could uh, look at. Um, one of the things many people have heard about is this thing about conflict metals. Have you heard about this before? So, so that basically means that some warlord somewhere in the world is, you know, sitting in an area and controlling some of these minerals here, or it could be corrupt governments or something. And it's been very much linked to the DRC or Congo um, and some of the other African countries. Um, and if you, if you see uh, documentaries and, and, and uh, scientific papers and stuff like that, it, it very much looks like slavery, basically. Like these people are forced into these really horrible situations and um, you have a lot of, you know, human casualties in terms of the working conditions there. Um, you could also see that the mining corporations, the big mining corporations that, that doesn't enter into actually mining maybe, but come in and buy these sources and transfer them somewhere else is, is also, you know, some, some way also transferring wealth out of the developing countries and onto the industrialized countries. Um, of course, there's some child labor involved in this, and then we have all the environmental problems, toxic uh, pollution, heavy metals to go into waterways and soils, radioactive pollution, especially when we look at what we call rare earth metals, and, and uh, there's a lot of thorium and uh, uranium linked to that metal group, and that means that you know, radioactive materials is also coming into you know, nature and humans and animals and stuff. And uh, <laughs> greenhouse gas emission, and of course biodiversity. And then, actually, <clears throat> the way we mine things today is very inefficient. Like, it's it's uh, it's it's you know a target at some middle. So, if we mine for for gold, we we might also dig up some 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 other precious metals. But if gold is the main thing here, the paying metal, so to speak then all these metals are also lost. So it's not really <laughs> the best thing. And then um, if you look at this, it, it really paints the picture is that like uh, from all these cell phones you probably have in your pockets and stuff like that, uh, up to 80% of the CO2 emissions is embedded in, in this process from, from mine to, to uh, manufacture. Uh, and only around 20% is related to when you use it. Uh, and that's calculated from using it every day in three years. And this is on the websites of uh, Apple and Nokia and Samsung. They actually put it out there, like do their life cycle analysis. So if we can basically bypass this process in some way, we will uh, we'll get rid of some of these problems. Um, I will skip this one. <laughs> it's a calculation, but it basically shows that you know, it also, there's also a big difference of which metal we are talking about. If it's a, a very special or precious metal, terms a, a more base metal, that's how we divide them. Um, that the, the production of copper that goes into electronics today are 15,000 times greater than the production of gold that goes into electronics. But there's so much more CO2 linked to the production of gold. So it actually corresponds to one third of the copper. That's, I should have, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, so some pictures here that basically shows how it's done. This is from China, Indonesia, tin production down here. I think it's rare earth metals up here and also rare earth metals over here. And uh, this is from Africa. We can see, so it's it's really simple way, and you know this uh, this open pits where they, I think we have a picture here where he actually, you know, it's it's you know very spontaneous <laughs> in a way. Like they, here's the some minerals, and then we dig a hole, and then like we just start, you know, digging out some stuff, <laughs> and and what everybody can you know probably imagine is that. At, at some, sometimes, you know, these pits will, you know, collapse and, you know, stuff like that. So, 
it is not so good. And basically, I term this, this is an end game. It, it will never be sustainable. It, it is what it is. There's so many problems linked to this you know, part of a product life. So you know, just doing a little bit better or using a little less of something doesn't solve the bigger problem here. So how do we go about uh, solving the environmental problems of these products we every, everyone uses today? And um, we do it like, uh, we, we talk about like, you know, green or sustainable products or so-called so sustainable products. So, so you probably know it like when you go down in a store and it says like in, environmental friendly or something like that, or it has like some label or, you know, it has been, you know, a little less used uh, or maybe like recycled plastics or something like that. And so what I would term here, and this is actually the, uh, the point of intersection in a way, it's, is the way we look at, you know, solving some of these problems today is by, you know, it's very technocentric. It's about, you know, making the product a little greener so to speak, you know, like we're trying to make it a little greener. So, <laughs> uh, so everybody's looking at the product and then, you know, it's like, hey, can we make it a little greener? And, you know, can we, can we, you know, we do something here. But um, what I wish you to understand is that maybe we should look a little more like, you know, actually the, the, the pattern we are working on here. And, and the issue is that um, as, Powerman describes right here. In the last 30 to 40 years, we've been trying to do or make more environmentally sound products, environmentally friendly products. But basically, it hasn't really solved anything for us. We, we have, you know, the, the consumption levels are just going up. And so doing a little, you know, a little better or a little less use or something or a little more efficient or a little more productive doesn't really change the bigger perspective. So that's why maybe it's not enough. And so <clears throat> what this circular economy is also about is, is trying to look at how all these actors and, uh, you know, interact <laughs> with each other and are linked in a big web how, how the, the consumer can be linked up to the producer in a, in a more beneficial way and how recyclers can, you know, cooperate with the producers as well and stuff like that. Um, and, and maybe make this green circle around this whole system of the product. So see it as a social technical system instead of seeing it as a way to, you know, only technological optimize something, you know? So, um, and again, eventually that will hopefully change the product to be more sustainable. So that's the, the basic thing of the circular economy. And so inspiration, where, where does all these uh, thoughts come from? And um, uh, in, um, in my work, I was looking into industrial ecology. That is basically go about like being inspired of ecological systems and how nature works. And seeing, you know, companies or, you know, industry producers uh, becoming an organism instead and working together with other industrial organisms. And, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, what they produce is, is, is products. So this, that's the non-organism part here. Um, and, and they should produce it with, you know, the use of free energy, like in biology. Um, which would be renewable energy, of course, and uh, maybe using excess heat from, you know, uh, a partner company. Uh, industrial ecology is, is, is not like confined to like a very uh, um, limited space, so it doesn't have to be, you know, a local area where two or three or ten different companies work together. It can also be a, like a global system where, you know, a net of different actors work together in a way to uh, to help this. Um, and, and one of the most important things in, in industrial ecology is, is about creating these food webs. And that goes back to this whole system I was trying to explain with like a lot of linkage between. So how can a producer of uh, electronic product work with 
the suppliers and the refiners and the disassemblers and recyclers and all these different actors that could go into this system. And um, this is uh, from an OECD report that roughly describes what it's all about. It's a closed loop production. So we have like this circle where we start off with production, of course, or material sources that come into production, packaging, distribution out, and then we have a use phase <coughs> where the waste shouldn't go to nature. <laughs> and um, so these uh, like process of resourcing or remanufacturing or you know, reusing the products all is a part of, you know, to make this, the whole system go around and get most of the resources back in production. In nature, there is some exchange, but it, it, it often, uh, when we're talking about you know, thousands of years or, or millions of years when, when we talk about minerals, you know, you know how many years it takes to, to make mountains, and that's basically that new resource uptake you know, from a little of minerals that's washed down every year from waterways and stuff into an ecosystem that is the new materials that is coming in. But so a very little new material is coming into an ecosystem and very little material is, is leaving, if you look at a big picture. An ecosystem is really good at like, keeping materials in, intact. <coughs> so that's the whole point here. And um, where industrial organisms, um, so to speak, uh, maybe have an advantage is that when you look at it in, in, in an economic perspective, there's uh, you could see them as kind of like initiators. They they have the possibility <laughs> to to uh, you know negotiate in a new way with their supply chain. They they have the possibility to to uh, uh, you know control their own resource uptake. So in nature, if we have to look at nature again. It, nature works on evolutionary principles. So it means like if there's a climate change in the area or if there's a disease in a species or something like that, they, they will have a hard time to adapt to this situation. Or at least it could be catastrophe. So cradle to cradle is what I would term more like a design principle that you know, is linked to this larger perspective, where it's about having a biological circle and a technical circle. And for electronics, it's mostly, you know, the technical circuit we, we should look at where you, you see a, a component in a, in a product as, as, you know, a, a part that some way has to come back again, either going through a, a refining process or as a whole component being remanufactured into a new product. So that would be the technical cycle. There is some perspectives in, in the way we can maybe make electronics in the future where the biological cycle can actually go into it and maybe help the way we make uh, substrates that, you know, where we link our uh, printed circuit boards and stuff like that. Um, so there's an extra interesting perspective in how that could maybe help to um, liberate and separate some of the metals that is really in a, in a very complex way is, uh, is linked up in these products. But that's also very much what the problem is about. Um, so before the break, I just uh, want to finish with this uh, old guy that I, um, I did my like, uh, theoretical background. And then I um, came to Boulding. He made this think piece uh, back in the 60s. And, and that actually, you know, talks about this whole circular concept and what is actually important. <coughs> and um, he talked about this uh, difference between like a cowboy economy and a spaceship economy. And, uh, <laughs> and how we should look at Earth as one big spaceship, basically. And so in the 60s, there was, uh, you know, there was the first space e exploration and the moon landing and all that. So space was the hot subject. Uh, and Star Trek was created and all that stuff. So everything was about space and uh, the old world was uh, you know cowboy land and what he mean about this is of course is there's, there's always this idea of a new frontier there's always new land to conquer there's always a new place to go to find resources and you know we have to conquer nature in a way um, but maybe what we will 
we probably realize in these years that there's not much of Earth left that has not been touched. Or basically we are in a situation where we should, you know, conserve the nature and, the, you know, protect it. Uh, because we've touched a little too much on the nature. Um, and and, and so, so the, the idea today actually is still locked into this cowboy economy thinking, so to speak. Um, where where I, I see, you know, uh, examples of, you know, we have to go to, you know, asteroids to mine metals in the future. So we have to fly spaceships into the space and, you know, land on... <laughs> it's pretty crazy in, in my head, but like, I don't know <laughs> what you think. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, you know, go to other planets and, you know, dig up stuff. I don't know. But in a way, I, I just think, like, maybe we should just have to learn, like, how to live like here on Earth first, and you know, instead of you know flying out into space, so we we already kind of do this thing, like you know, <laughs> on our space stations. So like you know, cycling all these materials and water and air and you know. So a space station, as this international space station we have down here, is is basically the, the system we need on Earth. We and Earth is part of that. So, you know. Yeah. I think you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so that's that's his, this whole thing. So um, in this part, I was I will I will try to go a little more into how I was researching the area a little bit. So this is a graph that shows a little bit about the the overall methodology I was using for for my thesis and. It's called backcasting, and it's often termed as the opposite to a forecast. It's not really, but it's, it's a way to start off with creating a vision for the future. So you start off in the future, maybe 30 years in the future, or 50 years, and it's a good way to see, like, so how do we want the world to look? So do we want a sustainable society? Yes. So, you know, how does this sustainable society look? And so, of course, this is about like what would be sustainable in terms of ICT products. And um, so, I was trying to create this vision. And on top of a lot of uh, theory and all that stuff, we elaborated upon uh, in the last session. Um, and then, from this vision, you go back and see, okay, so what is the problem in the current system? So that's the, the B part here, the, the, the baseline. First you, you see there's a problem and then you go back and see so what is the problem today where, where doesn't it mix with a sustainable future. And uh, then you create some scenarios for the future. So instead of in a forecast where you start off by making a scenario like, okay, we could do this or we could do that or we could do, do this and then see, you know, in a, for instance, like a cost-benefit analysis so what would that mean? Um, we try to, uh, what some of the like uh, theorists have said, like try to avoid walking in, you know, in blind alleys, so to speak. So we try to go the right way the first time. <laughs> and you know, so that's the whole part of you know jumping in the right holes here, into the future. And uh, then the last step is of course to decide what solutions would be the best to implement. So it's just a little other way. <laughs> um, and I want you guys to try to do this a little bit in the end, because we're always finishing up with that discussion or you know, a little workshop thing in this uh, Tolstice Cafe. Um, so, yes. <laughs> um, so my vision, that's a, well, a long one. You don't have to read it. Because I've been uh, trying to paint out the, the most important things here. So basically, I tried to write a long, thorough description of something about preserving information and control of the product. So what is happening you know, after you sell a product on the market today is that the producer doesn't know what's actually happening with the product after. Like, and they probably don't care as it is today. So, <laughs> So uh, the information of where the product is in society is lost and 
nobody has control of it. Like it's you know used by somebody, and then we don't know where it ends up afterwards. It can end in the in the waste bin, or it can end on you know in a re reuse uh, uh, market somewhere, or you know many ways. Um, and then ensure, of course, resource and value transfer. And that basically means that we have to protect the resource that's inside the product. So the resources are embedded in a product. So that, that's a very physical perspective. And then there's a lot of value in those resources. Um, so that also has to you know, be preserved in a way. And so what I maybe said earlier was that you know, we don't have to be so technocentric and you know, look so much into design. That, that's not totally true. It has to be, you know, uh, you know, a two-sided thing. Of course, we have to look at a big perspective, the big system, you know, how everything is interlinked and connected and all that stuff, but also have to, of course, enable technological innovation to happen in the product, you know. So we have to figure out what is needed here. Um, uh, so, yeah, this, I, I, I made this so you could, like, basics, what is the difference? And you probably have, you know, you know computed that now. But it's something about that we have today a linear system where some material is taken from Earth somewhere, designed, manufactured, distributed somewhere, consumed, used, and ending up in end of life somewhere. And some of the resources and value and all that is lost. Um, so that's the linear thing. And that is often termed as the take, make, and waste pattern. Um, and uh, what I wanted to do is then, of course, to you know link these two ends <laughs> back to each other, and you know so regaining this knowledge and resources and value back into design manufacture. So that's the simple thing. So I went about like a long, long, long analysis of all the problems that happen in this phase, and it is tried. You know, I tried to you know put it into this graph that shows what is happening after this product, so that's the post-commercialization phase. So everything that happens after the product is put into market. And um, so, um, you know, I worked a lot on mobile phones. <laughs> you will see that. So, but, um, uh, so, so, so one of these mobile phones, one of the producers, they ship them to a retail. And in Denmark, it's mainly the tail operators. That would be TDC, Telia, Tre and Telenor main ones that has stores and there's a lot of uh, online tail operators as well which is basically sub companies of the other ones anyways they sell the products on behalf of the producers so the producers don't really have a lot of retail themselves here especially not when it comes to mobile phones when it comes to computers and stuff like that maybe a little bit more but uh, so so they don't they they actually they disconnected already here <laughs> you know like so they don't even have the stalls themselves here. So that, that also creates a little problem. Then, then I don't want to go so much into the WE system. The WE is the e-waste regulation we have in the European Union. But the WE say, system says something about uh, extended producer responsibility. That means we want the producers to take responsibility on the products they put to market. So. That means they pay some fee, <laughs> um, and then they they you know put themselves into these collection organizations that basically has the responsibility of handing the waste in the end. That means collecting it and sending it to a recycler, and that's okay. It's very weight based. It's it's very focused on the quantity in a you know not so much on the product itself. So. That creates some, 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 you know, very inefficient systems here in the end. But then we lose, it's like all these blue lines here, or arrows, is basically possible losses. So, you know, uh, the consumer doesn't want this product, and then, you know, some of the retail stores, they buy back the products today. And then they, they put it into, you know, reuse on like a developing market somewhere. And that then it ends up in that, you know, where the Chinese women sit there and cook it somewhere, you know, like in a backyard. <coughs> There's a backyard recycling, as we call it. So that's, that, that, 
that definitely loses control of the product and the resource. And maybe some of the metals are going back, but it, these processes are very inefficient if you compare it to you know, state of the art, you know, smelting and refining uh, industry we have in Europe. So <clears throat> then, of course, there's uh, some of the phones here uh, that's lost into you know, putting it into the waste bin instead of putting it to the recycling station. <laughs> you know. So that's another loss. Then we have the actually processing where they get lost because they are mixed together in the products in the first place and because they have different um, thermodynamic uh, properties. And around like 50 metals are going into mobile phones today, 40 to 50. That basically is the whole periodic table that goes into producing these things. So it's like very exotic. <laughs> Uh, it is truly very exotic, and it's you know few milligrams and stuff like that. Um, so that becomes very complex to, of course, handle that in the end of life phase. And um, so how we do it is is basically to make some really uh, rough fractions, and we have some mechanical processing. That means shredding it and crushing it, and dividing it into iron and aluminium and plastic and precious metal and copper. So that's, that's basically it. And these fractions are very, uh, you know, unrefined in a way. Like, so around half of the gold is lost. Half of platinum is lost. Half of, you know, more than all these because they go into the other waste fraction. So if precious metals are going into the iron fraction or the ferrous metals, then it's lost. Then it becomes like a ship or something like that in the end. <laughs> so, you know, like, it's, it's lost there. And um, that happens, of course, in the end, where we do some end processing. That's the actually smelting and refining of the, the metals. Um, and, and first it enters there, then it's gone for good if it's not in the right fraction. So, and another thing is that uh, you can see, especially the precious metals and the base, some of the base metals as the, the paying metals. That's the, the metals that we recycle for, and the other ones are just, you know, assumable loss. You know, so we don't, we don't actually uh, get any of the rare earth metals back, or, you know, so. And, and some of these specialty metals here are really important in making a lot of these appliances that goes into you know, hard drives and the touch functions in your screens and all these like uh, coloring of your lid panels. And so, so without them, you couldn't make some of these products because they have unique properties. And that has made it possible to make the products smaller and smaller over the years also. So enough about the metals. Here's the problem. Okay, so uh, so I, I I took it down to some some design principles that can also be seen in correlation with the cradle to cradle perspective, but uh, use these design for something, design for X, um, as general industrial design principles. So it could be anything, but. Here it's designed for disassembly and designed for environmental sustainability. And the first thing is really important because it has about this liberation of the different components and resources in the products. Um, and also like how things are connected and fastened together and stuff. And I don't know if anybody tried to fix any of the electronic products themselves, but it is complex. <laughs> Uh, at least it takes a lot of time to liberate this. And, and if you have a recycling process and you have like a million phones you have to recycle, you can use like 10 minutes on each phone, right? It, it, it costs too much money. So then it becomes invaluable to do it, like from an economic perspective. And then if you want to get more of the metals out, you have to work on how the metals are interlinked in different metal groups also. And the thermodynamics of this, that's more technical, I don't even, you know, know all the details in it, but, uh, and of course, we, we reduce all the, like, toxic and uh, hazardous uh, materials that is, is uh, or, you know, limit them, or confine them, totally. Um, so, yes, 
And why I looked into mobile phones is I looked at like all the statistics and stuff like that. And what is very commonly known today in this business is that it's mostly the small e-waste products or we products. It's like nobody, it's, it's not such, such a big problem with like collecting a washing machine because nobody wants to have a washing machine when it's broken, standing at home. But like, so it's very easy for small appliances to end up somewhere, you know, bad. So this is the, the actually end collection we have of ICT and normal wheat from households in Denmark. And the opposite here for EU, which is a little less. Um, so, so what happens? Uh, <laughs> so how many phones do you have at home in your drawer somewhere? Three, two, one, three. So I did this survey, and some of you guys I know have, have, have done the survey because of, of course, you know, approaching you last year when I, I did it. Um, so what I found out was that, yeah, sorry, around, yeah, 1.87 phone per, per person. Um, <laughs> um, meaning that around two phones from, for every person. And that's around 10 million phones in Danish households, just like old phones lying in a drawer somewhere, or you know, and and there's good reason for that, and, or I don't know, some reason for it. Like most people, they they tend to to use it as a backup in a way. They they want to have it if they they lose their phone and they want to you know bring it to a festival or you know on holidays or something like that. Um, um, some people, they don't remember to dispose it the right way. It's, it's, you know, it's easy to just let it be somewhere. And like, I also have this like a bag of, you know, old wires and, you know, like stuff at home. Everybody has this kind of thing today, <laughs> you know. So, so maybe a lot of these materials is not even lost to, you know, resource markets uh, somewhere in the world. It, maybe they're just stored in the cellar or basement somewhere. Anyway. Um, but what we know is that we have had mobile phones for like the last 15, 20 years now. So, and we know from recent studies that only 5 to 10 percent is actually going into the normal recycling system. So that's the first thing. So the first thing is actually to collect it. So the most important thing is to collect it. So, you know, so we lose around 90, 95 percent of the resources as it is now. So. Get some good collection going is crucial here. <coughs> so yeah, that was uh, phone separated. Um, I don't worry about it. So some of the solutions. Um, so when you look to this circular economy idea, uh, most people or it's been talked a lot about these you know sustainable business models, and it often refers to this idea of product service systems. So where instead of having uh, a product that is just sold to a consumer, then you have, have it more as a service. Um, this is uh, also termed as, you know, instead of selling uh, a light bulb, you sell light and you, you know, or you sell this, you know, the service of having access to something. Um, and this, uh, <coughs> this researcher, uh, uh, on a talker, he has uh, made this um, uh, graph of you know the, the different uh, types of product service systems we we could uh, think of, and uh, the f the first category we in some way already see in many products today is it's it's you can get like you know extra service when you buy something you can you know hotlines and you know some abilities from the companies, you know, still have a little connection. Um, they, they are very much, you know, related to the product and, and uh, connected as like an, you know, an extra service or extended, um, uh, extended warranty. And then what is, uh, what is most interesting here for phones, I think, is the, the leasing and it is in the second category, the use-oriented business models. That is um, also uh, around like renting and sharing stuff, um, you know, for instance, you know, for carpooling or, yeah, stuff like that. Um, 
Um, but leasing makes sense in the way that it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you, you, you get access in a, in a, in a leasing contract to the product, but, and, and it's not like a renting situation would, wouldn't be possible for a phone because people will, will still have the feeling that they, in some way, you know, are entitled to the product, you know, and can do basically whatever they want. But <clears throat> that, of course, puts some responsibility on the consumer. And then there's a new responsibility situation here, a division between consumer and producer, or uh, the company, a business to consumer, basically. Um, the, last, the last category is more on the total service that, um, how many of you guys know Xerox? That is one of the most common examples, yeah. So Xerox is this, uh, printer and copy uh, company that basically owns the world in that area and they sell all their printers and copiers, professional printers and copiers to companies and they design them so they can, you know, separate them totally and stuff like that. But they sell them as a service. So if, if there's anything wrong, they go out there and fix it and stuff and they come and take it back. And so th that is, you know, a really good, uh, solution for them because it's, uh, you know, it's in wholesale perspective, it means that it's just business to business, it's, they can make contracts for years and stuff. So that's uh, more and more, you know, result oriented, meaning that you pay for that service. So that makes a lot of sense in, in that area. It, it wouldn't make sense that uh, uh, maybe so much with, with the more consumer oriented products. Um, I know, do you get what I mean? <laughs> yeah, good. <clears throat> so, I actually decided uh, not to go full on with the leasing idea uh, in my thesis. I actually decided to skip it in the end, but I went through all the, the thoughts of it and stuff. And so, how would it look? It, it, it's like today you have these repayment schemes, you know? So, when you buy a phone today, many people, they choose to buy through a repayment scheme. I can show you some statistics afterwards here. But, so they actually are linked to the, to the company for a couple of years, you know. So they pay both, for, they're paying off the phone and also to an operator for having access to, you know. Um, so wh why don't you just, you know, do leasing instead? <laughs> and so the retailer could le lease out the product and they could maybe work with a, uh, uh, service provider that can, you know, uh, fix the product if it's break, broken or, you know, sanitize it and, you know, replace the screen, whatever that could happen to the product. And then they could maybe release it again. They could use some of the spare parts for other products and like all this thing. So they lease it out and they can maybe do a, a second lease. And, and you, you would always have like the control of the product because it's still the company that owns it. Meaning it'd come back and then it could be transferred back to the producer. And then we have the end of life situation over here. And then what I see as the po possibility of making that technological innovation happen. So the o OEM can, can work with recyclers in the end of life uh, perspective and supply chain and all that stuff. Um, and of course, not everybody wants to lease the product somebody would always like to buy it on full sale price. So, like, so, so what is the perspective in this? And, and it turns out that, that uh, most people, they, they, they actually divide it in these, these three categories that they would always buy a used one or they would always you know, per purchase it as the, the, the lowest cost right here, right now, or somebody would always like to own it no matter what. Um, so, there's a good possibility to maybe to, to lease out to some of these consumers in the, the, the reduced sell price or the, the, the used product category. Um, and what people did uh, in the end, uh, what they actually did <laughs> was to do these repayment machines mostly. Or a lot of people actually just don't care and just go for a used one they can get from a friend or somebody. So that's there's only like 25% that's actually, at least of, you know, in my survey, that actually buy it at full sale price. Um, so, would people like to lease it? 
And uh, I would say like around half could be interested here in terms of this graph to, to lease a product. So that would, that would solve half of the problem, so to speak, with getting control of the product again. So that's not solving it 100%, <laughs> but it can solve a lot of problems and it can, you know, reconnect the business. So to sum up some of the good things about leasing is uh, you, would, um, you would have a new like property rights situation, you would have to share responsibility, that meaning that you would probably be needing to provide some sort of insurance along with the product. So if the consumer breaks the product, they're not entitled to pay off the whole value of the phone. Yeah, I would see like a chance for the, the producers to actually dig into the second-hand market a little bit more because they would actually be providing second-hand phones in maybe a releasing phase or something. So, so this is a good opportunity here. And then there's a, a number from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that calculated a, a lot of the retail value can actually be kept even in a second sale phase. Um, and we have seen these leasing plans happen already in England now. And a like, really new report from last week just showed that, that uh, they actually uh, are pretty successful, at least for, uh, from Vodafone, um, are pretty successful with these leasing plans. The sustainable perspective is maybe not so big in it. They, they have a very like, commercial perspective, of course. They don't even call it leasing because leasing is not cool. <laughs> so they call it red hot or something like that. And uh, they, you, can, you, know, you, can, you can get a new product after a year and then just deliver the old one back. So, you know, so it's very, you know, short life cycle on it. But so what I was uh, really interested in is this idea of a uh, deposit system. So that's what you know as a patch system, uh, like with bottles and, you know, beverage cans and stuff. And um, first, of, I asked, like, people think it's a good idea to have, um, and, and yes, a lot of people think it's a really good idea. They know deposit systems already. Um, and and uh, this, this, this result uh, is backed up in, in a survey by the engineer for eating, uh, Ida, and uh, uh, Danmark's Natural Fulling as well. So it's, um, it's pretty clear that people, they, they would like this idea of having a uh, deposit on. Um, so I was trying to figure out like what is, uh, what is uh, the actually deposit size we should put on the product or on the mobile phones? And um, so the important part here is to say that I was asking first of like, so how much would people actually return it for? So, and, and, and secondly, what would they accept to put on top of the price? Uh, because it will be some sort of like, you know, feeling as a tax in a way. So it doesn't have to be too much. But if you pay 5,000 for a phone, maybe 200 kroner is not so much. Um, so that corresponded to 250, that was the maximum average value. And then 200 kroner was the, the fair value that people thought was, was good for them. And it actually also corresponds to what in, oh, that was a little too quick, to uh, in, in, in terms of return, you could get like, at least that's what people say, around 85% back uh, of, of, the f of the phones. Um, so that's a high collection. So 200 seemed like a, a really good value. Um, so then I tried to draw a deposit system, how it could work. And basically the deposit is placed in a retail store somewhere and is paid out in the end um, at a collection point. The collection point in my worldview, would be both uh, in the retail stores, but also maybe at the normal uh, way stations we have around the country, because people are familiar with that. Um, then, of course, there would be some information linked to when the deposit is placed and also when it's paid out. So a lot of information is kept in this system, and this is very valuable because you can create a database and you know what's coming in, you know what's coming out, every year, um, the, 
the producers they can use that to you know optimize their processes uh, and their business around every product, but uh, public authorities can as well use it to monitor the system. Um, so some of the perspectives on this was that to start off with, like, uh, with a pilot project in, in a single country, and of course I look just at Denmark, um, you could do it, start up by, by doing this information collection campaign of the, all the old phones that people are lying around to, you know, get that going and um, yeah, to, to, to pay for the system cost to, to have it running, like, what cost to set it up. Um, it can very much be paid. I, I did some calculations on it and it can be paid by the unredeemed deposits. Uh, deposits. That would be the last percentage that people don't come to claim, basically. And the metal resource could actually pay for the system alone. So the metal resources and value that's embedded in it, which is around 16 kroner, could actually pay for the system cost. You don't even have to. So you, can't go over, you can go over 100% collection. So it, it's pretty solid, basically. Um, so the last thing I want to say is this thing, idea of end of life management, which is, so what would happen after you have collected it in a smart way, like leasing or, or a, a deposit system. And so you have the collection system up here in top, you have the market, the collection system somewhere, and then you source the product in, in some way back to the producer, or at least get the producer back into the chain to you know, decide what, to hap what should happen with it. And uh, I talked with, uh, or I interviewed some of the, uh, the end processors down in Germany, um, and we came up with this uh, idea that has been talked a little bit about why, why do you in the oil and chemical industry and some of the other like car industry and stuff, they actually subcontract a lot of these uh, metals they use in the industry to the refiners. That means that they keep ownership. So the producer keeps ownership. They subcontract it to the end processor, meaning that they only pay for the service of getting it refined and getting the metals back. So they get control of the metals afterwards. So they pay for the service of getting it done, basically. And um, that can maybe create some you know, really positive perspectives here because you know, the producer would be really inter interested in you know, getting as many resources back and the end processor would probably also compete about being the best at a job. So that can create some of this technological innovation we would need here. <coughs> then, of course, there's a big responsibility on the producers to transfer the metals or the components they get back to suppliers. And that's maybe the, the biggest question here because a lot of, uh, just in phones, they have you know, hundreds of sub-suppliers for all these different components and a lot of them are interlinked. So <clears throat> that would probably in the start be something about choosing some of the elements and, you know. And another little thing, I just try, whoop, was this thing about process certification that you would certify from a public perspective how this in processing is going, so you can use it like to document your company profile. So a lot of companies would probably use this to, you know, green their you know, image, brand themselves, um, and for it not to turn into greenwashing would be a good idea to have like a public scheme how to do this. So the metals are actually, you know, uh, certified and going back into their uh, supply chain. <coughs> And uh, from a public perspective, I was also looking a little into e-curating. And there's a lot of uh, the operators, uh, a lot of the big operators, Vodafone and O2, Telefonica and Splint and all these, they're trying to do these e-curating systems because a lot of people are asking for information about, you know, like what is the environmental side of the thing I buy. Um, and that could maybe also be linked to this whole thing. So if you do like a, a a big eco rating system on electronics, you could use this a little bit more um, as a way for producers to use their achievements in a good and transparent commercial way. 
that's the, the whole idea.